It was in the spring of 1966 in northeastern India that Norman Borlaug came face to face with the enemy he had been fighting all his life. Borlaug was a driven man, a scientist obsessed by hunger. And he was tormented by the thought that all of this could have been prevented if only people had listened sooner. For years, Borlaug had traveled the globe, preaching a radically new approach to agriculture, one that he had helped develop over the course of 20 years. Unprecedented population growth was straining the food supply of countries around the world raising the specter of widespread famine and social chaos. Next to the pursuit of peace, the greatest challenge to the human family is the race between food supply and population increase. That race tonight is being lost. Dr. Norman Borlaug, an Iowa-born crop expert, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize yesterday for his work toward easing the world's hunger problem. Within just five years, Borlaug would be hailed around the world for saving countless lives through what was called the Green Revolution. But Borlaug's stunning successes had also unleashed vast, turbulent forces. The number of people who are hungry decline dramatically. But there's enormous social upheaval. There is huge environmental damage. Norman Borlaug was responsible for the spread of large-scale industrial agricultural production around the world. I certainly don't think that it's any credit to the Nobel Prize that Norman Borlaug got it. Half a century later, Borlaug's revolution continues to shape our world. It's really impossible to understand the massive growth of the human population, to understand the urbanization of our species, to understand our tremendous increasing ecological impact on the world. Unless we understand Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution. very small farm in northeastern Iowa. And it's isolated in a way that is very hard for a 21st century person to imagine. On very quiet winter nights, Norm and his sisters would go out. They could hear the train whistle, which was uh, 14, 15 miles away. It was the only connection they had to the rest of humanity. Norman Borlaug was born in 1914 into a clan of immigrant farmers. His great-grandparents had fled Norway in 1847, driven by the same potato blight that ravaged Ireland. As children, Norm and his two younger sisters rose before dawn and worked on the family's 100-acre farm until after sunset in a manner that would have been familiar to the ancient Romans. Every year, he harvested himself a quarter of a million years of corn. He worked very, very hard, but he hated it. Norm had no prospects whatever. He had to stay on the farm and work. And then when his father died, he would take over. In the late 1920s, when Norm was finishing grade school, he saw signs of a technological revolution that was transforming rural life. Henry Ford produced a little tractor, and that tractor did for farmers what his Model T did for the general public. The Fordson, it's called. Typically, in those days, about 40% of a farm was devoted to growing food for the oxen and horses. 
we had a tractor that land became available to grow food and the farm's effective size doubled their income doubled or to have corn harvested in a couple days in a tractor was an incredibly liberating experience for him anybody would draw a lesson from that and he certainly did that this kind of technology equaled freedom from toil the fabled future had arrived, Orlog recalled, and was even more fabulous than anything we dared wish for. That's how he got some education beyond eighth grade. Because of the tractor and these modern things, he had confidence in technology for the rest of his days. Within a few years, Borlaug's bright hopes had been swallowed up by the Great Depression. In Iowa, the rain stopped. Clouds of locusts blotted out the sun. Dust storms buried farms and towns alike. Warlog's high school graduation was an eerie affair. No one mentioned the future. In the fall of 1933, with just $61 in his pocket, he left the farm for Minneapolis. He hoped to get an athletic scholarship at the University of Minnesota. He didn't think he was very smart. He didn't think he was well-educated or any, anything like that. He hoped this was his way into a better life. Not only was there no sports scholarship, it took an entire term and three separate applications before the University of Minnesota opened its doors. He chose to study forestry, then something of a campus cult, representing both a rebellion against capitalism and an escape from its collapse. Food and shelter were a constant struggle, but there were consolations. Borlaug was moonlighting as a waiter when he met Margaret Gibson. My mother was waiting tables to pay for her education. I think she thought he was very serious, and my mother was not real serious, but she had a great personality. In the fall of 1937, with graduation around the corner and a job waiting at the forestry service, Norm married Margaret in a quiet ceremony at her brother's home. But their tidy future vanished just three months later when Norm's forestry job fell victim to budget cuts. Suddenly at loose ends, he went back to school for graduate studies in plant pathology. But the most indelible lesson of his college years took place in the streets of Minneapolis. He walked around a corner and there was a milk plant. Norm could see behind a big fence a bunch of corporate goons with batons. Across the Midwest, desperate farmers were trying to shore up commodity prices by cutting off the supply of food to the cities. We'll eat our wheat and ham and eggs, they chanted, and let them eat their gold. Dairy farmers were going to dump the milk because they couldn't sell it for enough to make a living. Hungry people descended on these trucks and demanded the milk. And all of a sudden, they, they charged, and Norm was trapped by the crowd. And these batons were coming right towards him, swinging and hitting people over the head. Bodies and blood were scattered and spattered all over the street, poor Lug wrote. I took off running, trembling, frightened. I'd seen how fast violence springs to life when hunger, misery, and desperation infect the public mind. It was terrifying to him, and he saw how hunger can just turn, as he sort of put it, men into beasts. <laughs> 